Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today we're gonna to talk about exhaust back pressure on your turbocharged vehicle, why it happens, what happens when you have too much exhaust back pressure, and what you can do to mitigate it. Before we jump into exhaust back pressure, let's first talk about how the turbocharger works. So the engine exhaust leaves the cylinder and it turns a turbine wheel that's on a shaft that turns a compressor wheel that forces air back into the engine, producing what we all love, manifold pressure or boost. Boost is the air mass that's stuck behind the intake valve in the intake manifold waiting to go in the engine. And exhaust back pressure is the air mass that's stuck behind the exhaust valve waiting to get processed through the turbine. Just like the boost pressure or manifold pressure is stuck in the intake manifold, exhaust manifold pressure is stuck in the exhaust manifold waiting to get past the turbine and go back into the atmosphere. To further understand exhaust back pressure, let's briefly talk about parasitic loss. With a supercharger, parasitic loss is very easy to understand. You have a crankshaft that's driving an impeller and that creates a direct loss. So let's say you have a supercharger that gains 200 horsepower to the tire, but you've got to lose 50 horsepower just to turn it. And you'll see that in your fueling numbers because now you've got to fuel for an additional 250 horsepower, even though you only got 200 horsepower to the tire as the gain. With a turbocharger, there's not a direct parasitic loss like a supercharger. What's lost in horsepower potential with the turbocharger is due to efficiency. So the more back pressure you carry through the system, the less efficient the system is. A good illustration of what's leaving the exhaust port can be seen in NHRA top fuel. If you watch the video in slow motion, there's these wonderful flames of energy that are leaving the engine free to go back into the atmosphere. This engine is operating with only boost pressure and no back pressure. Turbocharged engines have the same thing going on, but you don't see it because it's trapped in the exhaust manifold, but you have the same high temperature, high pressure energy leaving the exhaust port as the piston comes up and getting stacked up waiting to turn the turbine. So let's put another term into the conversation and that's gonna be pressure ratio. If you have a turbocharged engine that has 30 PSI of intake manifold pressure or boost and 30 PSI of exhaust manifold pressure, that engine is operating at a one-to-one -one pressure ratio. If you have an engine that has 30 PSI of intake manifold pressure or boost and 60 pounds of exhaust back pressure, now you're operating at a two to one ratio, which is not favorable. In a perfect world, you'd only have the exhaust back pressure present needed to create the boost pressure that you wanted. So if you could potentially operate the engine with 60 pounds of manifold pressure and 10 pounds of exhaust back pressure, it would be a really, really awesome combination. Now hard to get there because there takes a certain amount of drive pressure to turn the turbine to turn the compressor wheel. So you're always working through compromises. Installing an exhaust back pressure sensor is not very difficult. You just need to get a pressure sensor into the turbo header, manifold, or turbine housing to get a reading. The environment's pretty nasty, so that sensor is gonna be on a leash. So you're gonna have a piece of copper tubing or stainless tubing moving the sensor further away from the heat source. And there are some kits available in the aftermarket that'll make it easy to install. There's also some companies that offer dampers so you can clean up that signal so it's not so noisy when you go to read it in your data system. Now we've discussed how excessive exhaust back pressure hurts the engine efficiency, which is gonna hurt power output. Let's also talk about what else can go wrong. So when you start stacking all that heat up in the form of excessive exhaust back pressure, you make the engine more knock prone because it's getting all this heat trapped in the cylinder. You need to get that heat out of the system. So if you have an engine that has a high back pressure, you're gonna to have to run the mixture richer and the ignition timing lower to keep it from detonating. Whereas an engine that has a favorable lower back pressure ratio, you'll be able to run that engine leaner and have more ignition timing. So not only does the engine efficiency help increase the power output, but the tune-up gets a little bit more aggressive without adding more risk. Now that we understand that excessive back pressure is a bad thing, let's talk about the big influencers. First and foremost is the turbocharger itself. So if you had a 2JZ with a 6466 and say you wanted to make a thousand horsepower with it, you could, but if you look as the engine's approaching redline, boost pressure is falling, back pressure is stacking up, and horsepower is decreasing. You wanna pick the turbocharger that can be operated at a favorable pressure ratio for your power goal so you're not overusing the parts, causing undue stress on the entire system. The second influence would be the turbo system itself. Because turbochargers are so good at making power, most turbo systems are more focused on fitting the packaging in a vehicle 
and not for peak efficiency. A good example of poor packaging and how it hurts an engine would be a V6 or a V8 engine that one of the banks is feeding the other bank before the turbocharger. Back in the 80s, they had Buick Grand Nationals and that's how they were done. One side of the engine was feeding the other side of the engine as it went up to the turbocharger and that bank of the engine would run hotter in the tune-up than the bank that had some more room for the heat to be exhausted. Another good example of how turbo system packaging can cause excessive back pressure would be Cletus McFarland's Ruby Corvette. It used to have a turbo kit on it that the driver's side bank was feeding into the passenger side bank of the engine and then up to the turbocharger. And as those guys went to run that car hard to get it in the sevens, it was overheating one bank of the engine because it had all that heat stacked up. The fix was simple, just put a conventional turbo kit on it that each bank of the engine was free to breathe right up to the turbocharger. So again, turbochargers are very flexible, but you wanna be mindful of how the system's laid out in the vehicle. Some of the most efficient turbo systems in the world were done back in the 80s with Formula One. And when you look at the systems, you understand that those guys had a good handle on airflow and how it affects efficiency. Adding an exhaust back pressure sensor can teach you about the efficiency of your turbo system as a whole. And when picking a turbocharger, you wanna pick a turbocharger that can meet your power goals at a responsible pressure ratio and a manifold design that complements it well. As you go up in turbine flow, you're gonna be increasing turbo lag, so keep that in mind. It's a balancing act, but done correctly, you can have a combination of parts that makes good power and lives a long time. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.